It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Latter-day Saint historians have long demonstrated that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was not established all at once, but that it has unfolded line upon line, precept upon precept, to borrow a biblical phrase. Ideas about priesthood in Mormonism, for example, have developed over time in fascinating ways. A new book from Oxford University Press called The Power of Godliness gives us one historian's take on the development of priesthood. Jonathan Stapley is the author, and he joins us here to talk about LDS priesthood and ritual, everything from baby blessings and baptism to temple ceilings and everything else in between. Before we get to it, I want to thank Colin Stewart, one of our new interns at the Maxwell Institute. He helped with some of the audio editing on this episode. It's the first time anyone other than me has played around with the recording before it reaches your ears. So thanks, Colin. And also Camille hoglid messick She's taken up the duties of transcription for the show. She's transcribing these latest episodes, and she's also going through the back catalog to make sure that people will be able to read every single episode. You can read full transcriptions at mi.byu.edu slash mipodcast slash transcript. Okay, our review of the month comes from Fred Axelgard. Here's what he said about the show. I've been listening to these podcasts for well over a year, and I find them the best thing out there in LDS listening for those with an academic interest in Mormonism and related topics. Blair's a superb interviewer, always prepared. The guests are excellent, and he lets them shine. Hats off to the Maxwell Institute. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate the kind words. And I hope people will follow your example, leave a review on iTunes, and people can also email questions and comments about this and other episodes to mipodcast at byu.edu. Now on with the show. We're speaking with Jonathan Stapley about his new book, The Power of Godliness, Mormon Liturgy and Cosmology. Jonathan Stapley joins us here on the Maxwell Institute podcast to talk about his new book, The Power of Godliness, Mormon Liturgy and Cosmology. Jonathan, thanks for being on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. Thank you very much, Blair. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to talk about how your book opens up. It opens up with this really dramatic scene. It's Brigham Young. He's in bed. He's very sick. You say he's tottering in and out of consciousness, and he's camped out at the Mormon refugee camp in 1847. The Mormons have just left Nauvoo. They're headed west. They're in dire straits, and Brigham Young's sick, and he has this vision. Talk a little bit about that. Great. Actually, this is a really important moment in the development of the LDS Church, and some of the listeners may be familiar with the vision because it actually does appear in modern discourse. In this vision, uh, Joseph Smith appears, Brigham Young recognizes him, and it culminates with Joseph exhorting Brigham to f- lead and lead by and follow the Spirit of God, which is uh, dramatically reassuring a message for Brigham Young at this time. Uh, it's a moment of peril for the church as they are essentially refugees crossing the continent. The larger issues at play, however, are Brigham Young has an extended family that's growing. They've left the temple. They're on the trail west, and he has this vision at a moment of crisis. And the first thing he does after recognizing Joseph and exulting in his presence is to say, look, I'm not sure that I completely understand everything that we did in the temple in Nauvoo. So can you help a guy out here? And, and Joseph's response is to open up a grand panoramic vision of the pre-mortal world. And, and then really Brigham Young explains his take on that vision, that the world was organized before humans were in relationships and that they had to be made perfect in this life, in the temple, these relationships reforged. And that network of relationships was called the priesthood. It's an interesting way to talk about what the priesthood is. The priesthood in the modern LDS church is typically thought of as the power and authority of God that men receive and that women work under the direction of, as we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But your book starts off with the story of how this panoramic vision of humanity, of God's children, how that cashes out in everyday life through the concept of of priesthood and through liturgy, the word liturgy. Talk to people a little bit about what liturgy is, what you mean by that. Right. So um, so that's a term that's familiar to other um, Christian traditions and non-Christian traditions and is a little bit foreign to us uh, in, in the Latter-day Saint Church. But truly what it is is um, the system of practices – 
rituals, ritualized actions that believers participate in to celebrate, to worship, and to um, mark major life events. So when I talk about liturgy, it's a category, but I will also talk about specific things. For example, the temple liturgy or the healing liturgy, and it comprises the ritualized acts. Perhaps to make it more concrete, there is a baptism ritual, but there's also a baptismal liturgy. We can recognize that we wear certain things. Um, there are certain steps that perhaps in a bishop might welcome. There are certain talks, perhaps on the a baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then we're all familiar with, and that um, those ritualized acts comprise the baptismal, the modern baptismal liturgy. And so, liturgy is something that applies not just to baptism, but other things like temple ordinances, and things like blessings, and baby blessings, and grave dedications, and things like this. And we'll talk about as we go through the interview. But I wanted people to kind of understand this: uh, what we mean by liturgy up front, because at the beginning of your book, you write that a fundamental force in the development of Mormonism's liturgy has been conceptions of priesthood. Now, some listeners right off the bat are going to hear the word priesthood and their eyes are going to glaze over. If you're driving your car right now, you might want to pull over. I don't you know. Uh, <laughs> we don't want uh, anyone to be in danger. So before we dig in more, I'd actually like to hear you talk about why this topic excites you enough to write a whole book on it, because I think what you're doing in this book really brings some excitement to the topic. Thank you. This is a, an exciting topic for me, but I think Maybe not as boring as you sell it to be. Don't You don't have to sell me on it. I'm saying, like, <laughs> people out there, <laughs> say, oh, we're having another lesson on priesthood. Okay, right. well. <laughs> so, um, well, if, if we're talking about how Mormonism is organized, the authority, the work that people do within the church, it all hinges on conceptions of priesthood. Throughout the history of the church, these conceptions of priesthood have been fairly dynamic, and there are sometimes conflicting worldviews between the present and the past or within various presents. And so as a, a person that's a, as a trained scientist, I come to the topic really interested in kind of the rules that govern systems. So what are the rules that um, govern how a system works? And then creating models to understand these rules is kind of my natural inclination as I approach any topic, but especially one that's as important to me as faith. And I hope that people noticed you talked about their conceptions of priesthood. Your book talks about how ideas about what priesthood is and even what the term referred to have changed over time for the LDS Church. And so what you do in this book is you trace these changes. You're using journals and records and examples from everyday Mormons in mundane settings, both women and men. You're also giving a history of landmark developments in Mormon ritual as well. So you're showing how it, how ordinances and rituals sort of play out in Mormon life. And then you show these moments where big changes occur as well. That's kind of how we'll go through this, this mm -hmm. discussion is to talk about those moments in addition to some of the stories. So let's talk about founder Joseph Smith's observations about liturgies and practices of other faiths. Uh, some of the things that he said early on in his own ministry about liturgies. I'm thinking specifically about remarks about Methodism, for example. Right. So a famous comment by Joseph Smith is that, you know, Methodists were correct as, insofar as they went, but they didn't go quite as far as he would have hoped, and that Mormonism takes you the rest of the way. And that's in an interview with Peter Cartwright, a, a Methodist minister that wrote, after the fact of his experience with Joseph Smith, early in his ministry, so Joseph Smith is very familiar with Methodism. We share a vocabulary with Methodism and things like general conferences and certain offices in the church are shared with and perhaps drawn from Methodism. Yet yeah, there's this sermon uh, early in the Kirtland era where Joseph Smith stands up and he calls out the Methodist discipline. So the Methodist discipline is essentially the general handbook of Methodism. Yes, yeah, their handbook of instructions. Right, yeah. And it, and it gives um, all sorts of instructions about church governance and other aspects of the faith, but it also includes detailed textual patterns for liturgical activities. So how baptisms would work. How, That's right. Yeah. So what you should say when you baptize, what you should say when you... Set that, apart a minister or exactly. whatever. Yeah. And, and he gets up and he calls out the Methodist discipline. And, and basically, he says it's the black deformity of, of the Methodist discipline. He has very... I mean, it's the, not a fan. Not a fan at all. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the, the kind of the worst thing he says about anything uh, in that early period. And the well, question is so why? About, yeah, why? Why? 
right? Because we have a general handbook, so yeah. we're like, what's the big deal, right? And he, in his revelations, began to codify things. I mean, they had the articles and uh, and covenants of the church and this sort of thing as well. That's so. right. Just a year later, the, the Doctrine and Covenants is first printed. Um, this is after the Book of Commandments. And so the question then becomes, well, what's different between them? Right? Why, what's the difference between the Doctrine and Covenants and the Methodist discipline? And my hypothesis and my argument is that while um, the Doctrine and Covenants is quite heavy on exhortation, it's really light on law and polity. So whereas the Doctrine and Covenants has a baptismal prayer, mm-hmm. you know, a couple dozen words, right? Well, the method, Sacrament prayers. Yes, you know, just short little bits. But how to do that? Like, what should you wear? When should you baptize? What do you do with your hands? Do you have to hold your hands a certain way when you baptize? Do you, you know, there, there's all these um, details that are essentially worked out uh, on the ground level as as the church develops. Well, the Methodist Disciplines Baptismal Liturgy shares a similarly short prayer. It's actually shorter. And actually, uh, the Methodist Baptismal Prayer uh, is entirely incorporated in the Mormon Baptismal Prayer. So it... it it's got the same words. Exact a little bit same more. words. The, the Mormon baptismal prayer has an authority clause. Hmm. But it's got almost a thousand additional words that surround the, the ritual of baptism. It's, their liturgy is complex. You bring how you present the child to be baptized or adult to be baptized. And the words that you say in a sermon before or after kind of interpreting the event. I argue that this represents a sort of stricture against the revelation. Joseph Smith did not want to be constrained. He wanted to reveal, and it's rooted as well in kind of the anti-creedal, the anti-creedalism of certain evangelicals of this period. Joseph Smith wasn't the only one that said, if it's not in the Bible, these other works, creeds and handbooks. That, creeds are abominations, right. so on and so forth, yeah. He wasn't the only one doing that. So during this first first five years, as he's developing Mormon ritual and, and having revelations about things like baptism and so on and so forth, you trace about nine main rituals that that come into the church in this in this early phase. Talk about those really quick. All right. So the the Articles and Covenants of the Church is essentially the first main foray into liturgical development. This is um, a section in, that's still in the Doctrine and Covenants now, or or what's in the Doctrine and Covenants is yeah, based absolutely. On that, right? So yeah. it's it's been edited a little bit over time. And the antecedent was Oliver Cowdery's Articles of the Church of Christ. Which he drew out of the Book of Mormon largely. Right. Yeah. So in the Book of Mormon, you have baptism, laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost, and ordination. So that's what figures in Oliver Cowdery's articles. Joseph Smith takes that and reveals more. He adds a baby blessing, which is actually quite remarkable. They're the only church in America at the time that I can find that, that is doing something like that. Others have done a dry christening before that, but it appears that at the time, the Mormons are the only ones, even though other churches now will do similar rituals at this time. So that's that's the bedrock of Mormon liturgy is, is these short verses in the Articles and Covenants. Okay, so we have baptism, baby blessings. What are the other rituals from this first phase? So in the Articles and Covenants, we have baptism, confirmation, the Lord's Supper, ordination and baby blessings, so five. And then within the first couple of years, you see the development of healing blessings, patriarchal blessings, sealing blessings. So oftentimes we think of sealings in terms of the um, current Mormon temple liturgy. But when the first high priests were ordained or the high priesthood was bestowed in June of 1831, kind of their special mandate was to seal people up and congregations up into eternal life, a, a great blessing for the period. And it would uh, happen like in the context of a prayer or something, right? Or like a blessing, like I bless you and seal you up to eternal life. That kind um, of Yeah. Thing. And oftentimes they would, you know, walk into a congregation and seal the whole congregation mm. up into eternal life. Mm. And lastly, foot washing. That's that's perhaps one of the most complex uh, rituals to talk about because it's integrated into various liturgies and adapted over and over and over. Like it'll pop up in different phases of how Mormon ritual was working. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's a really fascinating part of it. But so we have this sort of base of rituals, and then there's going to be this expansion that you that you trace in the book. More ritual development happens, for example, at the end of 1835 with the Kirtland Temple. So what are some of the additions that we see happening around that time? All right. So the Kirtland Temple is a pretty interesting expansion because we have the introduction of consecrated oil. It's hard for modern people to understand the significance of washings and anointings. 
you know, I, I probably took a half hour shower this morning and it was awesome. I loved it. Warm water, I presume. It, it was great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but in this period, I mean, really the, the winter bath hadn't been invented hmm. yet. So imagine it's been months before anyone has bathed to go and prepare yourself to enter the Kirtland house of the Lord. They wash themselves with often soap and water and then rinse with clear water. They perfume themselves with scented whiskey. And then they anointed themselves. And this is all kind of a recapitulation of the Hebrew temple experience, well, right? He's pulling this out of the Hebrew scriptures. That's right. Getting inspiration from there. That's right. And Were other Christians using things like an anointed oil at the time? Um, so n the short answer is there are some antecedents, but they're quite rare. Hmm. So the German... Baptists, of which there were some in Ohio, did use uh, anointing for healing blessings, mm -hmm. but it's really, really rare <laughs> in America. There, there are strains of it that follow through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe Joseph Smith was influenced by that, but um, there's really no, no evidence to connect um, yeah. various traditions. So you have this preparation in the temple. Foot washing is recast in the School of the Prophets, and then again, in, in the Kirtland House of the Lord, where the people that were prepared through this washing and anointing, perfuming, participated in a solemn assembly in Kirtland, and then um, experienced this endowment of power where there was great Pentecostal gifts. Um, Joseph Smith's scribe, who kept Joseph Smith's journal, wrote, you know, this is a, a great endowment forever to be remembered. Yeah, and Joseph had been promising that. The Revelations talked about, I think, endowment, it says. Is yeah, kind of endowment. Funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Odd spelling, but yeah, an endowment of power from on high. Um, we're f familiar with that term. It's, um, People wanted to, like, ritualize this. I mean, it seems so much more in, in the New Testament when you read about the day of Pentecost, they're sort of preaching, and then these flaming tongues of fire come down, and it seems all very, very uh, spontaneous. And here, Joseph Smith is sort of trying to codify that or sort of harness that into a sacred space that's been set apart for that purpose to sort of bring that endowment of power down, like you're participating in the creation of it. That's not right. Not just waiting for God to send it whenever he wants to. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. I, so uh, an important premise of the book is that, at least of the first chapter, is that Joseph Smith was tremendously interested in bringing the power of God into the lives of believers, and he created ecclesiastical and liturgical structures to mediate that power. And this is one phase in that development. So after this um, Pentecost in the house of the Lord, they have a foot washing, and they repeat that process yearly, annually. So Wilford Woodruff, who most Mormons are familiar with, wasn't in town. The next year he goes through the same pattern, but once they are endowed with power, um, all the priesthood that has been ordained participate, are endowed with power from on high, and then they go out and preach the gospel. I think Mormons, many Mormons may be unaware that that's the, that precedent is taken directly from uh, the Bible, that Jesus is the resurrected uh, Lord's command to tarry in Jerusalem uh, until they are endowed with power, and then they can go preach, preach the gospel. All nations, and, and that's yeah. what happens in Kirtland. Um, as far as we can tell, Joseph thought that was probably it then, too, as well, right? Like, it, yeah, I mean, we don't get the like, indication right. that more would be coming after that. That's right. Um, I, I guess one important bit, and I think something that's tremendously important in the liturgical history, is that as soon as there's consecrated oil in the temple, it's taken out of the temple and used for healing. So that's where um, our current healing liturgy comes from. Where men in the LDS church today have consecrated oil, they'll often carry it around on a keychain or, that's right. or in some way, and then they, they will anoint the head with just a little bit, just mm -hmm. a drop, say it, put their hands on their head, say a blessing. And seal and it. Seal that. We, they actually seal it. The language of sealing is That's used, right. And, yeah. and the reason we do that is because that's how the Kirtland Temple liturgy was. That was their sealings when right. they talked about getting sealed. So you take the yeah. Kirtland Temple liturgy, it's adapted to healing, and we've done that ever since. And, and that, that's a pattern that happens again later as well, as I imagine we'll talk about. How does that tie into women giving blessings? Because today in the LDS Church, men are ordained to the priesthood, a specific priesthood, and then that gives them the authorization then to give these blessings by the laying on of hands. In church history, we know that, uh, that women participated in healing blessings. Were they using consecrated oil? How were they going about that? That's right. So I think it's first important to note that there was all uh, – there were many – ways in which healing is ritualized in, in the LDS tradition. And the authority to perform these various rituals was not tied to a specific priesthood office until rather late in the tradition. So for example, when Joseph Smith Sr. is first ordained patriarch and starts giving patriarchal blessings, he clearly tells women, yeah, you should be healing people, um, you should be blessing them. 
it appears that um, from the earliest moments, the healing liturgy, much as prayer is today, public prayer is today, was something that all church members were authorized to Just do. Like you could give an opening or closing prayer at a Mormon meeting. That's right. Men and women could also bless. And yeah. So specifically, your question about consecrated oil. Um, yeah, so consecrated oil was one of the healing rituals that was in the Latter-day Saint healing liturgy. And women and men both employed the ritual forms to bless the sick. It's really interesting during this Kirtland Temple period as you see some of these words begin to enter the Mormon lexicon here, sealing, and different priesthood was being understood in different ways. So leading up to the Kirtland Temple, what did the word priesthood usually refer to? Because it wasn't quite what Mormons today think of when they hear the word priesthood. Right. So um, in the earliest moments, so we, we project our current understandings on, on historical sources, which is really easy to do and, and really common. So it's normative today to talk about uh, a Melchizedek and an Aaronic priesthood as a kind of a classification under which uh, the various priesthood offices are organized. There's a lesser priesthood and a greater priesthood. So one of them's preparatory, and then the other one's kind of the full priesthood. Yeah. Right. And I think I'll point to Bill Smith's article on the development of Mormon priests because I think it, it is a key to this argument. But early on, uh, when, when the church was organized, there was no uh, Melchizedek priesthood and there was no Aaronic priesthood. Joseph Smith revealed uh, four offices of the church, deacon, teacher, priest, and elder. There were no presidents, there were no quorums. You were ordained to an office in the church and then you did your job. So if a decision had to be made, you would hold a council or a conference was the actual term. And those who attended the conference would make a decision and then the rule of the conference would be the rule of the church. Over time, things get more organized and Joseph Smith reveals structures like the presidencies, like the councils, like the quorums. And by 1835- He's reworking older revelations to fit those newer- um, Yeah, he's schemes. giving new revelations and older revelations that haven't been published are kind of repurposed yeah, and reformatted. Joseph Smith Papers Project, who showed how they've been edited and updated. That's yeah. right. And and the, perhaps the, the most dramatic phase of this is with the revelation of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, because that all of a sudden creates this organizational structure. There were revelations that talked about lesser priesthood and higher priesthood, but those revelations were talking about the office of priest and kind of the office of high priest. Hmm. So it's kind of weird to think about. So if you go back and read um, the Olive Leaf, for example, and it talks about a lesser priesthood and higher priesthood, when the it was- Section 88? Uh, four, six, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, actually talking about these kind of ecclesiastical offices and not what we think of today as the Melchizedek priesthood and the Aaronic priesthood, mm -hmm. and yet it is easily read mm -hmm. we that do. way. Yeah, Mormons today um, do, yeah. And, and it works very well for that purpose. What's interesting is after the Kirtland period, there's this Nauvoo period that sees a greater expansion of the, of the church's liturgy in, in the 1840s. And this is where you bring up the idea of the cosmological priesthood. And this is a way that early Mormons understood priesthood that has largely faded today. That's kind of a key to your whole puzzle, I think, in the book. So talk a little bit about what you mean by the cosmological priesthood and, and how that took shape in Nauvoo. Right. And, and I'll confess right up front that the term cosmological priesthood is slightly idiosyncratic. Yeah. So what you see at the time, Joseph Smith reveals the Nauvoo Temple Liturgy. It requires uh, an expanded set of rituals, but also an expanded cosmology, wherein salvation, government, priesthood and kinship all get wrapped into the same thing. And what happens is the people that participate in these rituals, women and men, as opposed to in Kirtland when it was, it was just, just men, men, right? It, it, it's incorporating both, not because he wants to be inclusive, but because it's essential to the cosmology. It simply cannot work without both men and women. As the participants talk about their experiences at the time, they would talk about uh, the priesthood, the priesthood quorum, the quorum, the priesthood order. They would say, you know, I went to the priesthood this afternoon and prayed. And that sentence would make no sense to modern Mormons. Right. And what they meant is, I went to this group who participates in the temple liturgy and we prayed together. And so they referred to this group of people that are experiencing the Nauvoo liturgy. Men and women. Men and women yeah. as the priesthood. And so this is posed as a challenge to scholars and yeah. believers alike. Yeah. 
So people have said, well, did Joseph Smith give, give women, women the priesthood? priesthood? Yeah. And it's like, according to your book, yes and no is kind of the answer. Yeah, so right? not in today's terms. Right. But this idea that the temple liturgy creates heaven. Right? It literally— This is the cosmology. This yeah. is the cr- literal creation of linkages that make up heaven. Right. Literally make up heaven, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It's not, we're not using literally figuratively. Yeah. This is literally <laughs> heaven that is being constructed— on the temple altars. And it's sealing people in relationships to each other. To each other. Yeah. And it's within that context that Joseph Smith's statements make sense about the uh, being alone and single and how that is essentially hell. Yeah. Right? That is what it means to be outside of heaven. And there's all these different relationships um, that get revealed in Nauvoo. That are, talk about polygamy for a second. I mean, what what does this new look at priesthood add to conversations about early Mormon polygamy? Right, and and there's lots of ways of looking at polygamy. I'm I'm not saying that the cosmological priesthood is the only way, but it is an important way to to view it. And that's to say, Joseph Smith is in Nauvoo. There's many believers there. They have children, and they have uh, Joseph Smith has this mandate to construct heaven. And so how do, you, how do you create this structure of heaven on earth? How do we link each other to each other? And one way that this is um, done is by sealing men and women together in ways that is transgressive of kind of proto-Victorian norms. Yeah, monogamous right. Victorian marriage. Yeah. Right. And biology. So when Brigham Young comes on and the temple is ready and they start sealing parents to children, the, the rule for, for virtually the entire 19th century is you cannot be sealed to someone that is not a church member. So if your parents have died, they never had a chance to accept the gospel. You cannot be sealed to them, yeah. period. So and who, you weren't, couldn't do ordinances for them yet either, correct? Uh, you could bap- be baptized for uh, them. I mean endowment stuff. Right, that's like, later. In other words, you couldn't be sealed to them because they couldn't receive all the temple blessings at that time. So you would instead be... Actually, it's not even that. You can't be sealed to them because you can't be sure that they would accept the gospel. Okay. So it's actually about the uncertainty of it. Right. Because the this, this sealing ne- sealed network is literally heaven and we're actually yeah. building it. And so it is a sure thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's okay. a sure thing. And so um, we have Joseph Smith marrying multiple women, but also women that are married to other people. Because if you're going to make connections to the community they're going to be uh, more complicated than um, what we might assume today is standard marriage. Right. So this early polygamy was sort of tied into these kinship ideas of not just getting Joseph Smith more wives, but also linking people to Joseph Smith through these marriages as well in this exactly. building so out heaven. There's this that 1842 way. revelation that's never canonized. It's delivered to Newell K. Whitney in anticipation that Joseph Smith would be sealed to the Newell's daughter, okay? And it frames the entire relationship in terms of the cosmological priesthood. This idea, it essentially references priesthood and that this would allow, this linkage would allow the priesthood to be established and then pass from generation to generation throughout all time to the Newell's family. We'll talk a little bit more about sealing practices and polygamy and monogamy a, a little bit later on, but there's another implication here about Brigham Young's priesthood restrictions. Um, your book helps make the restrictions a little bit more coherent to modern readers in terms of how it fit Brigham Young's theology, but also in some ways it makes it even more tragic. Yeah, so um, I think there is a common misconception that we don't know why the priesthood restriction happened and the, the priesthood and temple restriction. Um, Member, black members of African descent could not uh, receive temple endowments or be sealed, and, or, and black men could not be ordained to the priesthood. Right. So what we see is that um, early on, before the um, restriction is made public and sort of formalized in Utah, there is a meeting with Cormor the Twelve. Lorenzo Snow says, you know, what, you know, isn't there a way we can do something to uh, extend salvation and the gospel to those of the African race. Now, by this time, there have been several men that have been African Americans that have been ordained to the ecclesiastical priesthood of the church, but there has been some controversy over interracial marriage as well. And Brigham Young at this meeting, uh, in response to Lorenzo Snow, reveals for the first recorded time his 
rationale that governed the priesthood restriction, which he repeated throughout his life. And, and it was this. He said, look, Cain and Abel were supposed to be nodes within the cosmological priesthood. They were supposed to... Links in the chain. Yeah. They, they were supposed to have a place and be connected to lots of people, primarily their descendants, being kind of prototypical uh, individuals. When Cain killed Abel, it wasn't just fratricide. He didn't just kill his brother. Yeah, it wasn't just like, oh, I, I killed a guy, right? Yeah. He actually fractured the cosmos. He cut off Abel and his posterities from being integrated into heaven. Because Abel should have lived, had these children, and then been sort of locked into these eternal relationships in heaven kind of a thing. That's right. And because and, he was killed, he didn't get the chance to. And, and kind of as repugnant as it is to us as modern observers, it's at least coherent, right? Yeah, there's a logic to it. It's not just, I don't like black people. It's, it's assigning black people this terrible role. It's, there's definitely racism involved, as far as I can personally see. Right. Uh, but I think, as, as you say, here's this logic. That's, why, that's what I mean by it being even more tragic and painful, because cause it was well thought out in a way. Right. It essentially cut off people of uh, black African descent from the family of God. Yeah. And that's their just desserts for this supposed sin that their and, supposed and, ancestor committed. Right. Or and and yeah. Brigham Young was clear that once Abel's posterity was somehow miraculously restored, right. the, that yeah. then Cain could have his posterity restored as well. So that's this idea of like people would say, well, Mormon leaders always said blacks would eventually receive the priesthood or something. But it was in the context of this story that's really uncomfortable and that we don't, that, that Latter day Saints don't teach anymore. That's right. And it's entirely foreign in, in a way. So yeah. while uh, I think it's important to note that this story, that this narrative that Brigham Young crafts, it is essentially a restriction within the, the cosmological priesthood. But one of, the, I think the ecclesiastical restriction is kind of secondary. It, mm. it happens as a consequence yeah. to this temple restriction, if you will. And over time, throughout Joseph Smith's life and well into the 20th century, church leaders reference this as the basis for the restriction. But Joseph um, Smith re referenced it or did you mean Brigham Young? Um, well, Brigham Young and subsequent leaders. Yeah, yeah. Like, you said Joseph Smith, and I was like, uh, no, he didn't. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking of subsequent Joseph okay. Smiths. Oh, Joseph F. Smith, Joseph <laughs> Fielding Smith. Okay. Um, Just so we're clear. Um, so this was a referent as people talked about it, but yeah. after the declension of the cosmological priesthood. Needed new explanations for why. Right. So yeah. we, we have these kind of weird things like fence sitters yeah. or less valiant, less valiant in the yeah. preexistence, yep. which gain traction. Yeah, but you don't see that happen until – you can see those stories start to fill in theological gaps when the cosmological priesthood idea had had diminished. By right, then, because yeah. the killing of Abel just doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, like, yeah. What? Why the, yeah, exactly. Okay, interesting. People can read more about that in the book. We're talking with Jonathan Stapley. He's the author of The Power of Godliness, Mormon Liturgy and Cosmology. And as you can tell, dear listeners, we are coming at you with a fire hose in this episode. There's so much to talk about. This book is – under 150 pages, but it's packed with fascinating information, uh, way more than we can cover. But uh, we're going to do our best to give you a really good idea of some of the fascinating things that are in this book. The next thing we'll talk about is another big shift that occurred in 1877 with the dedication of the St. George, Utah Temple. There was a sweeping change that transformed the very fabric of the cosmological priesthood. Jonathan, that's, that's how you put it. So this is the rise of what you call ecclesiastical priesthood. Another shift in Mormon liturgy happens in 1877 with the dedication of the St. George Utah Temple. What, what change happened at this moment? Right. So this expulsion from Nauvoo to St. George 1877, there, there is no temple. Yeah, the Salt Lake Temple is not done. Right. This is like the first temple that's done after Nauvoo. Right. And so they have various temporary locations where they administer aspects of the temple liturgy. Sometimes even in nature, they'll do some of the temple stuff on the plains. or Right. So they have temple peak. prayers yeah. along the plains. They'll do ceilings in people's offices. And um, we have that one example of Addison Pratt being endowed on Ensign Peak. It's fantastic. But there's some stuff that they would not do unless right. they had a temple. There's one thing that they wouldn't do. One thing in particular, yeah. And that's child-to-parent ceilings. Brigham Young called it the highest ordinance of the church, in fact. These child-to-parent ceilings and also adoptions which is child to parent ceilings to people that aren't between people that aren't biologically related. Like people might remember John D. Lee, participant in the Mountain Meadows Massacre, was adopted to Brigham Young. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and in Nauvoo, those uh, types of things were ways to connect the community together because you couldn't be sealed to people that weren't married. Yeah, John D. Lee's and John D. Lee's parents presumably weren't were members of the church. I mean, members yeah. of the church, and so yeah. So this is them locking into the cosmological priesthood exactly. through this adoption ritual. So this, um, it's been a long time. People don't understand uh, the rules at all because they haven't lived them. In fact, there's less than a hundred people that have been sealed. As child to parent hmm. up in, to this point. Because it happened so briefly right. in Nauvoo. And we get to Nauvoo. So we, we think about, or we get to St. George, and we often think about, this is when Wilford Woodruff revealed the entire proxy liturgy. And when so, he met all the founding fathers. Fathers, it's awesome. <laughs> um, and there's less about this aspect, the ceiling between children and parents returning. So th there's this return, and th there are some subtle changes that are made to the liturgy. But the temple building, the Pioneer Temple building continues till we get to Salt Lake. And these, the, the Latter-day Saints are participating in these actions, these rituals, but it's somewhat challenging because they can't be sealed to their parents if their parents weren't church members, or they can't seal their parents to their grandparents um, if their grandparents weren't church members. This is how Mormons today do it, but right. back then, back they, then could they, they could not. And so it presented challenges and, and adoption didn't feel quite the same yeah it just felt challenging to them so uh, there's this revelation in 1894 in the salt lake temple uh wilford woodruff stands up and he says you know what uh we, we've essentially been doing it wrong and he announces this revelation he says we've been doing the temple wrong yeah yeah <laughs> and what we're going to do now is we're going to go back and seal everyone as far back as we can go in um, your own families. In your own families. And how, how does this work? How can this possibly work? And his response is, well, there will be, f this is a direct quote, there will be few, if any, who do not accept the gospel. So they were worried about, well, if we sail to my great-grandparents, what if they're not interested in it? Because agency is a big principle for Mormonism. Mormonism. Some people would always have the ability to say yes or no to this. And then I'll be isolated from the, the grand off. network of heaven. Yeah. But his response is, you know what? Mormon universalism is the answer. Yeah, most people, almost everybody, is gonna jump on the wagon at some point. That's right. Yeah. And it, it solves the problem. Now, that universalistic explanation maybe isn't the most prominent way those changes are, are understood over the subsequent century, but it is uh, Wilford Woodruff's stated reasoning behind the revelation. Mm. Okay. How did this change the position of, of women in Mormonism? This was a pretty seismic shift. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is post-manifesto. So the manifesto is Wilford Woodruff declared the cessation of plural marriage. They ended plural marriage, at least for people, for mortals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Men would still be sealed to multiple women in certain cases. But he declared the end of polygamy. It took uh, several decades, several to, decades to finally it wind it all down. Go on. Okay, so... Um, so if, if we're looking at, well, what's not satisfying with how we do things? Like, what are the problems in the liturgy? What are the problems in the cosmology? And this adoption, like this chasm between us and our ancestors and the ceiling chain was one of them. And that was rectified. And so when uh, Wilford Woodruff brought this revelation to the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency before he announced it publicly, he brought it to him. And it was, I mean, everybody was unanimous. Man, this is awesome. This is the way it should be. And then George Q. Cannon, he, he says, well, yeah. He's this, a general authority. He's yeah, he's in the, the first presidency. Yep. Um, he says, yeah, this is, this is great. This is awesome. But we've still got some challenges ahead of us. And, you know, in, in a post-manifesto world, what about all the single sisters or the people that die without children and then can't be – that he, it's kind of a worldview that – I think makes us a little uncomfortable because it's rather sexist, but you know, if a woman is sealed to a husband, the husband dies early before they can have children, who would want to marry her? Because she's already connected to this other person. Right. Yeah. She's already sealed to another man. Who will raise up seed? Who's going to have kids right. with her? Yeah. And they have this kind of fascinating debate and it's, it's kind of shocking because he says, well, what if we do some sort of concubinage? Yeah. An where, arrangement where you could have children with without being not married to without married yeah. and um he writes in his diary i brought this up to kind of 
further the conversation along. I didn't want to be shocking. I'm sure some of my fellow brethren might have been shocked by it, but I just I want to figure this out. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about whatever options we can come up with. Here. Yeah, and um, I think that he was even willing to consider that. That's so kind of foreign to any sort of Mormon worldview is to show the amount of stress that the cosmology was under. Yeah. Well, within a few years, it's resolved, and it's resolved by Lorenzo Snow. He says, look, God is fair. And he points to his sister, famous Eliza Rashna, who, who wasn't able to have children. And he says, God is fair. And because of that, anyone that's faithful will receive all promised blessings in the next life. And, and we don't have to worry about that. And so that's how the, the sealing liturgy changes. That's how we, we reframe all the temple blessings and all the blessings we have. We kind of hold them out as expectations for the faithful. But at the same time, there is a dramatic reformulation of ecclesiastical priesthood. And it's this reformulation that uh, essentially sets up the church for the 20th century. And just as much as polygamy might have ordered the Mormon universe in Utah uh, in the 19th century, this new priesthood ecclesiology ordered Mormon life in the 20th century with its focus on monogamy and um, church office. So essentially what happens is church leaders are reading the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants texts in new ways. So they read the old revelations that say there's um, a higher and lesser priesthood. You know, that's the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. And we start thinking, well, perhaps we should be conferring this priesthood onto people before we ordain them to an office. And to um, separate this general idea of the priesthood right. to there's the priesthood and then there's these things inside the priesthood. Right. And um, the ordination text in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, there's, it's essentially an ordination in the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you to be a priest, preach the gospel of repentance. And that includes the priesthood, like right. you've got the priesthood. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen because it's a priesthood office. And these new readings suggested that we confer the priesthood generally, and, and there's resistance to it. John Taylor says it's improper and wrong and an innovation, counter to scripture. Lorenzo We're Snow. decades after Joseph Smith at this point. Right. Yeah. But Joseph F. Smith becomes one of the proponent leaders of this new reading. He writes about it in, in church articles, and then— And he wants people to come and say, first ordain them to the priesthood, and then— uh, Confer the priesthood. Confer the priesthood upon them, and then ordain them to an office inside the priesthood. Yep, and Or then, set them apart to a particular office. That's right. right. Yeah. And so— And that's new. Yeah, that's new. Yeah. And we do that today. We um, do. But it was, it was wildly controversial. Yeah. When he dies, they have to make kind of a statement that says, you know, different ways of ordaining are essentially comparable. Just we, go ahead and do it the way that— you think is working. But the old yeah. ways are kind of better, yeah. wink, wink. Um, <laughs> but with correlation, there's this, this move. In the 1960s. In the 1960s, yeah. there's this move to essentially make Joseph F. Smith's reading normative. But what's important this is— the church leaders like Bruce R. McConkie and so on. And, that, and that, Joseph Fielding Smith. That believe so the this is a better way to do it. Of, uh, Joseph F., right? Yep. So they're kind of going back to their relative and saying, yeah, we think he had it right. Let's have the church do it this way. That's right. But what's important to understand is that whereas the cosmological priesthood— of the Nauvoo Temple required women to be coherent. Because they were all being sealed together. Right. Um, the kind of ecclesiastical, the expanded ecclesiastical cosmology of the 20th century, where a priesthood exists outside and is conferred upon and then you ordain within an office, requires the exclusion of women yeah. to main coherence. And so for the rest of the 20th century, there's this struggle to figure out, well, how do women, how do they fit? And it's, uh, that's a question that's still being resolved in even the most recent history of the church. Yeah. What's the most recent development on that? You, uh, Elder Dal or President Dallin H. Hoax has recently spoken on that, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. In the early 2010s, um, women's roles in the church was prominently discussed in the media. There were protests about it, Temple Square and other locations. And President Oaks, at the time Elder Oaks, and other church leaders struggled to communicate the involvement of women in the church in terms of priesthood. And in 2014, uh, he had this kind of seminal general conference talk in which he expansively redefined priesthood authority as something that can be used by women by delegation from, from those 
with priesthood keys. So a bishop who assigns a woman to be a Relief Society president, she auth- he's basically authorizing her to use the power of the priesthood. She's not ordained, she doesn't receive the priesthood, but she's working with the... Yeah, and not merely the power of the priesthood, but the authority of the priesthood. Yeah. So she is using priesthood authority in her calling, which is a pretty large expansion of, of priesthood and priesthood cosmology, and it gets integrated into the curriculum rapidly mm-hmm. and is now, I think, the normative discursive mode. I think... Um, as, as we're nearing the end of the discussion here, I again want to tell people the book, The Power of Godliness, has a lot more information that, the, that you'll want to check out. One thing that I'll say is there's a, there are a lot of changes in here that you note. Things, for example, as women could be witnesses at baptisms and things like this up until 1976, or, mm-hmm. or uh, young women assisting with preparing the sacrament, and some of the things that have, have changed over the course of time. What do you say to modern Mormons today that encounter those things and, and wonder why the changes or wonder if they'll change back? Right. So um, I think there has been a tendency to view these items, women participating in the healing liturgy, the participation of women in various liturgical spaces that they no longer are as essentially a declension narrative, as a narrative decline. And I I don't think that's correct. I think that what happens, um, and it's it's extremely complicated, with the rise of the priesthood ecclesiology is a concentration of liturgical and ecclesiastical authority within the priesthood bureaucracy of the church. So, for example, um, boys passing the sacrament. The priesthood reform movement at the early 20th century was a move by church leaders to strengthen church activity of young men by extending priesthood office in a systematic fashion. But the first question was, well, what job, what do they do? And they settled on deacons passing the sacrament. And and there was immediate pushback. People ask, well, the Doctrine and Covenants says only priests can administer the sacrament. And the uh, general authority response was, well, look, um, that's not administering the sacrament. Women pass the sacrament uh, every Sunday um, down, down the pew. And so these priesthood officers, these deacons, are just taking that duty. And now, today, I think it has become essentially a priesthood function. I I don't think, from the modern perspective, there's any way of viewing the passing of the sacrament by the deacons as anything other than a priesthood duty. But would you say that it wouldn't necessarily have to be that way? And and Uh, No, no. I mean, uh, within the Latter-day Saint tradition, um, there are many activities with precedent that are no longer active in the church today. And changes happen all the time. So, uh, for example, women praying in church, we we take that as something that, of course, that happens. Women pray every Sunday. But women were restricted from praying in church for the bulk of the 20th century. Particularly in sacrament meetings. Right. Yeah. And and now it's normative. And so uh, I think it's up for... uh, all these questions are are questions that church leaders must grapple with. Yeah. It's it's their job to determine how a liturgical authority is dispensed in the church and who are the officiators of the various ritualized acts that we perform today. Yeah, so you mentioned sort of what their stewardship is. They LDS church leaders are the ones who sort of make these policy decisions and and, and you as a scholar, you're also a practicing Mormon. How do you see your work compared to their work? Hmm, that's really interesting. So I'm interested um, in describing Mormon worlds, right? So, uh, so as a scientist, if I find something, uh, some data or some evidence that runs counter to my understanding of a system or a problem I'm working on, it's actually a wonderful opportunity because it means that my understanding of the system isn't quite complete. And uh, of course, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say if I f- learned something about chemistry that countered what I had learned so far, I wouldn't say, oh, chemistry is wrong. <laughs> I've been lied to by my, my, my advisor. It's just, it's just not true anymore. What instead, uh, when I came to most of the data in this book, um, I took it with the similar joy and exultation that I might have taken as a scientist that, oh my gosh, there is a huge opportunity here to describe and create models that incorporate the lived religion of the people that I love. And so it's an act of, hopefully, it's an act of empathy 
uh, as a believer, but it's also an act of scholarship as a student hmm. to be able to understand how and why um, Mormons have acted and framed the universe as they have. Can you think of any downsides? Because you've, you've given a really good case for why Mormon scholars of Mormonism can really contribute to the conversation through empathy, through deep understanding, speaking from inside the tradition, but looking at it, sort of putting yourself outside the tradition to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Are there downsides to being a practicing Mormon and, and, and doing research on a Mormon subject? Um, not that I can find. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously biased. What I think is important is that Latter-day Saints go outside of the tradition to learn. So liturgical history, um, you know, Orthodox Christians and Roman Catholics, you know, they're the pros at this. They, they've had thousands of years to figure out how to do this, and they've gone through the growing pains, whether it's the modernist crisis or Vatican II, of grappling with their history. But the fruit is somebody like um, Cardinal Ratzinger, they Benedict, the who, Pope, yeah, yeah the, the Pope, previous Pope, who was essentially the, the like an expert at all of this, yeah. this stuff, and it only enriches the tradition. And so uh, my sense is that as we um, mature and are able to find these tools that others um, have used so well, that we'll be able to find a similar maturity in our past. It's Jonathan Staple. He's the author of a book called The Power of Godliness, Mormon Liturgy and Cosmology. It's a brand new book from Oxford University Press. And he's also a chief technology officer for a biorenewables company that deals with sugar. So uh, we don't have time to talk about sweets uh, on the show, but I will say I have a sweet tooth and, and it's a problem. But I want to thank you, Jonathan, for taking time to do this. I just have one more question. <laughs> This book is kind of your side hustle. Like you've got a full time job. How are, how are you integrating your personal life, your work life, with your with this as kind of a professional hobby, really? Um, yeah. So um, I think it's a labor of love, first of all. But um, you you have to make choices. I don't watch a ton of TV hmm. or play a ton of video games or things like that. So this is what I do for fun. Work is stressful. I I'm essentially in a company that was developed, created to industrialize my graduate work and I'm in charge of engineering and research and development and it's, it's mm. extremely complicated but it's it's nice to fall back into 19th century diaries <laughs> to ease my soul and mind <laughs> that's good well thanks Jonathan I had a good time this is a good discussion thank you very much Blair. yeah and I recommend again people check out the book it's called the power of godliness Mormon liturgy and cosmology thanks for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast